next section, um, part of it we'll spend, uh, as I just said, working with paper and pen. I've got some blank sheets of paper and a couple of pens if you, if you need it. And we'll spend some time beginning to map your emission sources, mapping your operations and, and what your emission sources are. Um, if you're a larger organization, you'll no doubt uh, you know, leave with just the beginning of a map. If you're a smaller organization, you may be able to capture most of your sources today, but um, hopefully you'll come away with a useful document that you can refer to as you, as you continue to think and, and plan about this. Um, and, uh, and then we'll open up our laptops and, and, uh, and you guys can um, just do a little bit of playing with that Excel spreadsheet uh, in just a little bit. Um, and then we'll hear from, from Howie, who's on his way. Uh, so what to include in your baseline greenhouse gas inventory? Um, the GHG protocol uh, gives guidance um, on kind of three different approaches. We talk about um, a control approach, um, and often we talk about an operational control. So uh, looking at your organization, you would include facilities and vehicles and activities that you have ownership and, and control of. If, you, if your company could um, implement policies uh, that, would, that could reduce emissions or change the way you do things, then, then that activity or, or facility should be inside your, your inventory. So that's operational control. Most businesses that we work with on the small, medium size side, operational control makes a lot of sense. Um, there's financial control where um, if, you, if you could uh, dictate policies and, and changes for your financial, um, your company's financial gain, um, even if you don't completely own an entity, if you choose to take that approach, that would be how you would draw your line. Um, more, and the other one that we commonly uh, hear about is the equity share approach. So if you're a large corporation and you have um, joint, you're involved in joint ventures or you have subsidiaries, et cetera, or partial subsidiaries, um, an equity share approach might make sense. And in that case, you would take, um, if you own 50% of a company, you would account for 50% of its emissions. So if you're a large corporation and you need to do some more thinking about that, that's great. Because it's important to think about how you're going to, where you're going to draw that organizational boundary. For today's purposes, for the purposes of our exercise today, we're going to take an operational control approach because it's, it's simplest and kind of cleanest. Because if you have control, if you can make set policies and make changes, you account for 100% of the emissions from that facility or activity. So let's work with that today. And, um, and then if, if you feel like you might be one of those, working for one of those organizations where you need to dig into this a little bit more, then you know, you'll, have, you'll have plenty of time to do that as you, you know, begin to establish your own GHG management um, program. And uh, so I wanted to just outline that. <coughs> so here's an, a, you know, a fictitious example. Um, the Better Building Company. And, um, and they've got, I'm just getting used to this. Um, they have a head office there and the, and the sources, they've listed the sources beside. Um, they've got a head office. They have um, their employees uh, coming, to the, coming to their place of work. That's certainly a, a, you know, a material and relevant part of their, of their business without their employees. Where would they be? Um, and they've got their company fleet. They've got a few trucks that their employees use to get to their jobs. This is a contracting company, by the way. It's completely made up. Um, they have materials being shipped to them. They've got their job sites. They've got subcontractors. They rent equipment. They, they subcontract pieces of work out to. And they have some business travel um, to conferences, to do sales, business development. They've got sort of um, people, people flying a little bit. So that's just an example of, of one, uh, you know, one operations map and the sources there. And they're um, burning natural gas for heat, and they have electricity. And, you guys, you know, don't you don't have to start trying to figure out your own yet. You'll have lots of time, and I'll kind of walk you through it. But there's an example. Um, another example, um, based on actually, uh, based on a real company, but you know, kind of, I drew this. But this is an example of some of our uh, some of our businesses coming out of our, our workshops wind up with, and they spend more time than you guys will get to. But they they wind up with a map kind of kind of like this. So they've got um, this is a. Um, this is a lumber supply sort of hardware store. So they've got the store, they have a warehouse, they've got their vehicles, 
office paper, business travel, waste. Um, they wanted to capture and their materials um, coming coming into the to the store and the and the warehouse. So just wanted to, to give you kind of an example of, of what your what your um, map could look like. So you guys are just gonna you know we're gonna have some time to play with this and start to start begin begin that process. Um, and uh, so once we've decided sort of to take the operational control approach, you know, what do we, so you can start thinking about, okay, what do we, what do we own and control in our business? Um, we, the GHG protocol developed this, uh, these categories of scopes, this, um, dividing emissions into, into scopes. Scope one are direct emissions. So those are emissions that we're generating in facilities or vehicles that we own and control. So our, our building where we're burning natural gas for heat, that would be a direct emission happening on site. If we own or lease long term a fleet of vehicles, that would be um, scope one or direct emissions. Just for interest sake, if you're working with ISO, uh, it sounds like you're working with both, but the ISO standard talks about um, direct emissions and then energy indirect and other indirect instead of scope one, two, three, but it's the same, you know, same thing. Scope two is, is purchased electricity. Um, so you're drawing it in and using it in your, in your facilities. In rare occasions, it can also include purchased heat. Um, I doubt it, given where you guys are, but is anyone on a district heat system? Yeah, so um, Vancouver in the downtown core, a lot, of the, a lot of the towers are heated by, there's a natural gas plant, they burn the natural gas, convert it to steam, the steam is distributed. Um, and, and heats the heats the building. So they're, in that case, they are purchasing heat, but very rare. So it's mostly, so far, I mean, we hear a lot more about district energy um, systems being developed, but, but for now, fairly rare. Um, so scope two is purchased electricity. Scope three is kind of everything else. And it, these are the emissions that our activities cause to happen, but they happen um, somewhere else. So when we get on an airplane to fly to a conference, um, you know, our we're we're part of, of causing those emissions from the from the jet. But Air Canada owns the jet, so it would be Air Canada's direct emissions. But it would fall into our scope three or our indirect emissions. Our paper consumption um, is another place where the emissions associated with manufacturing that paper is happening when the trees get. Um, get felled when the when the pulp is created when the paper is created, uh, but we're we're consuming that paper and we're a part of that that supply chain and so that can be part of um, part of our indirect waste as well. Um, at least most of us, unless we have our own sort of private landfill, most of us pack up our waste, we throw it in the bin, it gets taken to municipal landfill uh, where it decompo decomposes and emits methane. So it's a third, it's a scope three or an indirect emission for us. Um, so those are, those are some, some examples. And so we can get into, you know, we can get a ways down our supply chain and we can think about that. So let's start to, let's start to map. So, so start with those direct emissions. Start thinking about your facilities or your buildings. Uh, your fleet, if you have them, and just make a note. And some people, it, it's always interesting to me how people uh, draw this. Some people are really graphic and they draw their buildings. Other people come up with lists of text, whatever works for you. But just take a minute and, and jot down where you think you are um, burning fossil fuels in your operations. You know, where that generation is happening directly. Scope one and scope two um, are required by the greenhouse gas protocol. Scope three is optional, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But so it's it's all right if you're office based and you don't have any scope one. That's fine. Yeah. Okay, so scope two also pretty easy wherever you have offices um, or uh, facilities. Um, you are you're purchasing electricity. So just make a quick note of that. And then scope three is where it gets pretty interesting. Um, and you can think about the, the materials coming into your organization. If you're a manufacturer, you can think of your raw materials. What's coming in uh, and what's leaving? If you're more office space, you can think of your paper and your waste. Um, you can think of your staff, definitely. So staff commuting would fall into that scope three because um, you don't own or control them, uh, but, uh, but their, their emissions associated with them traveling to work is certainly 
uh, certainly part of your organization, certainly relevant. So just uh, start to start to think about what's what's coming in. Air travel. There's there's some examples up here. So I just got a great question from Jed about what about the end use of your of your product. So if you're making TVs, are you accounting for uh, the energy used when every time people turn it on? Um, and you could. The answer is yes. You could include that in your scope three. So back to this idea that <clears throat> scope three, there could be a lot of overlapping. Um, areas in scope three. Some, some include, some choose to include it, many don't um, and choose to go that far down the line thinking about end user. However, the more you track, again back to what gets measured gets managed. And uh, I was listening to a presenter from Sony uh, last spring talking about their emissions and uh, they did a whole bunch of, of work around their own corporate emissions and then they started to look at their, their products and the vast majority of their emissions are happening when people are using their electronics. And that allowed them to focus on redesigning the electronics. If they had just kept their boundary at, okay, what are our offices and what is it, you know, what's the energy used to, to make our products, they wouldn't have been able to tackle that and make some innovations in, in terms of energy efficiency in their product. So the question was, if you're part of an institution, would you include um, patient or student travel to you? And yes. Yes, you could. And actually, IKEA is an interesting example of that. So they decided that they would include the travel of their customers um, to them in their, in their inventory. So definitely indirect. It was massive, a massive source of emissions. And they set, set, set policies around where they're locating themselves. So to, striving in places to be less of that kind of far outlying box store and locating a little bit closer to public transit um, and making themselves more accessible. I know, and then I always picture myself with my bookcase on the, like, you know, <laughs> subway. But, but they are they are setting those policies. And um, the Van City, which is a, in Vancouver, a, a real leader in sustainability, it's Canada's biggest credit union. They've done a lot of, of work around this, and they they included um, their employee commute as part of their their footprint, and discovered that it was 50% of their emissions. They're office based. They're a financial institution, and they were not capturing the emissions of their investments. I must say that. Um, but that, that helped them see that that was an area for great opportunity. And also they're doing a lot around locating location of branches, incenting uh, lots of employee incentive to, to commute. Great question, actually, about scope three. There is no consensus about how far you should go. Um, but, there, but the protocol gives some guidelines around what to include in this scope three, this muddy area. First, let me say and restate that the protocol uh, requires that you include scope one and scope two. Um, so you, you shall include scope one and scope two in your inventory. Scope three is optional. Um, and they, they, they give some, some guidance. They, they suggest that if, it's a, if you think it's a significant source of emissions, or if it's really material to your business, and I sort of use this example, if you're an import-export company and you have five staff sitting in your little office and you only measure that and their, and their commute to the office, but you don't account for the movement of goods, it doesn't really pass the straight face test. So we talk about that as well. I think Dell Computer came under some fire for just measuring their corporate emissions, but not really accounting for the production of their, of their product. So thinking about, thinking about it from that, that perspective, but Jed on the other side of it, also being realistic about what data you can collect um, and not, not making this a sort of unfinishable, impossible task. And uh, we sort of talk about them as rabbit holes. You know, don't, don't find yourself down a, down a tunnel trying to find the emissions associated with the production of your copier when, you know, your, your main source of emissions is, is something entirely different. So being, being realistic, and they talk about reporting out um, and, and understand and recognize that you're reporting out on the data that is currently available to you. So stepping up, so staff commuting is fairly easy because you can do it through a staff survey. <coughs> Business travel is relatively easy because you have that information in your uh, receipts and travel expenses, etc. cetera. Um, working with third party shippers, products coming from China. Um, can be easy or difficult depending on your vendor. I know some of the businesses we work with have tackled what's doable in terms of third-party shipping in the first year, given their vendors and suppliers a heads up that they are broadening that scope. Um, 
Salt Spring Coffee uh, started to track the, the shipment of their green beans from Central America and other places because it, it doesn't pass the straight face test not to capture the transportation of their coffee beans when they're a coffee company, uh, and actually saw great opportunities there. They were, um, you know, they're a Vancouver-based or, or close to Vancouver-based company. Their beans were coming actually into Oakland in San Francisco by freighter and then getting put on a truck and trucked to Vancouver. And they realized that by shifting how they were ordering and ordering in slightly larger quantities a little bit less often, they could get that freighter to come all the way to Vancouver. And uh, it's a more, more efficient um, means of travel. Um, so there, there are... So three is often where you see a lot of emissions, but the more you include, the bigger your footprint looks. So just, you know, you're, you're dead on, Jed, and there's no, um, there's no set recipe. So again, asking yourself about that straight face test. Elizabeth. Well, I was just going to say, and there's, there's new uh, protocol around scope three, that, the guidance that's coming out December 2010, did you mention that? Sorry. Yeah, no, thank you. So yeah. this area actually is a, is a place that's getting more and more attention, and the greenhouse gas protocol has two draft standards out right now, one about scope three and one about product life cycle, because you can see that's also where your mind would go. Is, hmm, so how are we making these products and what's going in, you know, what are the raw materials coming in, how could we change that sourcing? Um, uh, and so it's in draft right now, it's being road tested, but you can pull it off the internet and, and check it out if, you're, if you want to dig into this a little bit. And it will be finalized and published, the schedule is by December 2010. So they're responding to this, you know, this field is new and people are, are getting more sophisticated and doing more thinking about it, and scope three is a place where certainly interest is moving to. So just quickly, we've kind of gotten to this, where we've already covered this, but the next step would be to draw that boundary. You know, where, what do you think you're going to be able to collect in terms of um, scope three, really? So you know your scope one and scope two is going to be in there. What are you going to try to gather in terms of scope three? And um, this will probably take more, more thinking and more inquiry, but back to better building, they decided for now that they were not going to include their subcontractors because <coughs> they just couldn't get that information from them at this point. And our suggestion would be communicate with them. You know, ha send out letters to your suppliers and your, and your vendors and, and uh, let them know that this is something that you're doing and you'll be gathering that information. And think about how to put those systems in place. So this gentleman just asked um, me to comment on the idea of asking your suppliers to, to tell you what the what emission what the emissions are associated with the with whatever material they're providing you with, and it, it actually really leverages the impact you can have, and it gets to our purchasing policies, and we can we can start to decide that we're going to prefer more environmentally sustainable or preferable products and services, and and give our suppliers a heads up that we're going to start to. Um, to ask for this information. And that example with the bottled water company and the financial institution, that's kind of what was happening there, right? They wanted to know um, what they were doing about it and what their emissions were. Um, and it can happen up and down the supply chain. Yeah. And I know you, got, you folks over there are working with a, with a client that is asking you to start to report this information. Um, so, you're, so you're needing to, to, to understand that. And they will, are making purchasing decisions based on that. So um, getting to the part where well, you guys will be able to enter an emission factor and think about how to calculate. But just briefly, this is from the Greenhouse Gas Protocol. Um, and it's, uh, it's getting to the process that you go through to collect your, collect your data and, and calculate your emissions. So first step, identify sources, which is what you've started to do here. You know, thinking about your, organize, your organizational boundary, operational control versus equity control, what's right for you. What are those main sources inside your boundary? Selecting a calculation approach. For many of us, using already published um, emission factors is, uh, is the easiest and, and most defensible way to go. In some cases, you guys mentioned where you might be able to come up with your own emission factor if you're emitting something and you can, you can capture that and, and you have the internal capacity to do that. Most of the businesses we work are definitely working with already published peer-reviewed emission factors. Um, so collecting that, that data and deciding what emission factors to use, and, uh, and we'll, we'll get back to that in a little bit. And then what tools are you going to use? Are you going to build your own Excel spreadsheets? Do you have that capacity internally? 
Are you going to use something that's available <clears throat> in the trade show? At the end of the day, you'll be able to look at a couple. Um, there are some calculation tools available through the, WR, the WRI, the World Resources Institute, and the GHG protocol, and other, uh, there are other resources out there. So, you know, how are you going to do it? How are you going to, um, <clears throat> to calculate the various emissions from the different activities? And then finally, rolling it all up so that you have a, you have a total um, annual emissions for your, for your operations, um, usually reported in, in carbon dioxide equivalent, tons of. So kind of getting back to sort of collecting data and choosing um, emission factors. Again, an emission factor is sort of helps us take a unit of activity and convert it to a mass of, of uh, carbon dioxide equivalent. Um, and so just an example here is, is uh, gasoline. And here we're using 500 liters. And um, the emission factor is from um, Environment Canada from the National Inventory Report. Uh, and it's um, 2.322 kilograms of carbon dioxide per liter. <coughs> the liters cancel out and you have a simple multiplication um, to get you to a little over 1,000 kilograms or a little over one ton, one metric ton of, of carbon dioxide equivalent. So that's it, simplified. Um, but that, that's, that's the idea of an emission factor. And um, there are, as I said, different sources. Um, the, the greenhouse gas protocol, but again, just a warning that they're quite US-based, particularly when you get to grid electricity, purchased electricity. Um, the Environment Canada National Inventory Report um, is a source for that. And grid electricity is a place where the factors do change as our power mix changes. Other factors don't change so much unless the methodology by which we're coming up with them changes. But as our power mix changes, those uh, those do shift, and the inventory report is published um, annually, um, kind of it's springish, and then uh, the and the, the it takes a little while for them to kind of confirm and finalize those um, those emission factors. You can ask local utilities for emission factors. If um, that's another source, um, and public transit authorities. If you're if you're really digging into the staff commuting piece. Um, for instance, in our own tool, just speaking to where, where we've worked, we have um, Vancouver-specific um, uh, public transit uh, emission factors as well, the city of Portland and Oregon, um, but we also have general ones that we've pulled off um, from, from the greenhouse gas protocol. So it depends, thinking about where to source them. If you choose to work with a, um, <clears throat> with a tool that's already been built or a, or a consultant that's working with you, They'll they'll provide those to you, and so you don't have to do that research and make those and make those calls. So here's the part where if you did bring your laptop and you've plugged in your USB, feel free to open that up. So most of you in the room, I think, provided Jennifer with some real consumption data, kilowatt hours, gigajoules, or square footage, and we used our sort of uh, estimates by area to uh, do do an estimate, definitely, of what your consumption might be, and plug that back into the tool. So most of you will have that to work with. If you're not, just going to walk along. If you don't have a laptop, just walk along with us. But it gives you, it gives you a sense of, of um, calculating an emission. Now, this, this spreadsheet that you have in front of you really is um, more of a reporting template. You couldn't do all your calculations in it. Clearly, the scope three and some other activities would have to be calculated outside that. Um, but the list that, that Jennifer has provided with you is, is also a list of commonly, commonly included um, activities. So hopefully it, it can be useful to you in that way. Uh, in this example, we've used uh, 400 uh, gigajoules of natural gas. So you can go ahead and enter for, for, your, for your heat, for your natural gas, you can go ahead and enter 56.12 in that column with emission factor. And hit enter, and it should calculate for you in kilograms what your what your emissions associated with your with your heating would be. So you can just get a sense. It's a get a sense of what that would be, and hopefully that uh, calculation is working okay for you. It's a straight multiplication as long as you've got the units the, the units right. So an example here is electricity um, is is often published in, in grams per per um, kilowatt hour. Yeah, grams of carbon dioxide. Per kilowatt hour, I've converted it to kilograms so that so that our, we're talking speaking in the same units. The, the electricity grid factors are are location specific, provincial specific, and then within um, some provinces where there's a multiple providers, 
you might have you might have different emission factors. Um, so definitely, if you have a facility in Saskatchewan or Manitoba, you need to look into a, a specific emission factor. So if you're ready to move on to the pink section with kilowatt hours, you could enter in that point one um, under emission factor and see what that see what that comes up with in terms of um, of kilowatt hours. And then just speaking to the, dif the difference, you can, if you want, you can play around. And, and British Columbia's grid, grid factor is 0 0.02. So you could enter that and see, see how that different that is for fun. Um, and that's because we have almost all hydroelectric, which is, from a purely greenhouse gas emissions perspective, very clean. So the question of comparing yourself to another organization uh, has come up. And it's a tricky thing. It, it's a tricky thing to compare. So it would make it would make sense where that data is is available to compare to a facility of similar size in a similar sector. It's hard to compare yourself broadly um, to to all greenhouse gas inventories across time. And certainly easier to compare scope one and scope two. Um, as Jed highlighted, if you if you're doing a really good job of capturing your scope three emissions your footprint will look bigger. And it's harder and um, not fair to, to compare yourself to an organization that has said, no, we are only measuring our scope one and scope two, and that's all we're doing. Um, so back to also this principle of transparency and the importance of reporting and being clear about what you're including and excluding uh, in your greenhouse gas inventory. <laughs> the best comparison is actually with yourself over time. Right and how how you're doing in terms of reductions. Moving on from from working specifically with your with your spreadsheets, but how how easy was it to get the information? How easy was it for you guys to, to find your your information for your electricity consumption and your and your heat? Anyone was it easy? Put your hand up. It was really easy. Yeah and difficult. Put your hand up. It was difficult. Yeah. How, why was it hard? Because I couldn't get an answer from the hydro company. Around the gathering data, I just wanted to get at the, the fact that if it's not already obvious that your accounting department is going to become your new best friend, probably, if they aren't already. So um, back to the idea of internal communication and letting them know what you're up to and, and that you're going to need help. And if there's a champion in there who, who is interested in environmental sustainability and measuring this kind of stuff, getting them on board. And in fact, getting other people on board in other departments um, to help gather the data and to, to get buy-in is really powerful. And then it's not all on you or your little department. Um, and the accountants can also help set up the systems that will make it easier to gather that data. And if they know that this is something that you're doing for the first time with every intention of doing annually, they'd probably be pretty motivated to help you figure out, to figure out the systems. But just acknowledging that the first time you do it, it's definitely, especially when you get into scope three, and it's you know it's a little more involved in going to your utility bill. Just thinking through how you're going to gather it. And I know Suzanne's sort of well on her way, and she's nodding as you think about, okay, how are we going to track this best, and who who can help us do this? So just speaking to that. So the question was around company growth, and um, if you acquire a new facility or a new enterprise, how do you account for that? And there are sort of thresholds and guidance around recalculating your baseline um, is, is one way to go at it. And so if, you, if something has happened so that, uh, and, and usually it's around acquiring a new facility, if your organization has changed um, enough so that uh, it's, it's significant, then you would sort of re recalculate your baseline at that point. If it's just organic growth and you don't have a new facility or new, you know, you're doing the same thing, you're just doing more of it, um, you just sort of, you know, there, there you are. But that's where intensity units or, or intensity measurements are helpful. So understanding your entire footprint and your, your entire inventory is essential, and that's what we're trying to do here. But also taking the time to understand it per full-time employee or per unit produced, per dollar revenue, can be, can be very helpful and can help you account for if you're experiencing a lot of growth but you are still taking action.